Adventures on the Gorge presents The Adventure Forum Adventures on the Gorge Resort sits on the very rim of the New River Gorge, America's newest national park. We have whitewater rafting that can be as mild or as wild as you want. We'll take kids as young as six and six to 11 year olds raft free every day all summer long. We have cabins on site, restaurants, America's newest national park. We have whitewater rafting that can be as mild or as wild as you want. We'll take kids as young as six and six to 11 year olds raft free every day all summer long. We have cabins on site, restaurants, zip lining, and a lot more. Plus, we're only a bridge away from the shops and restaurants of Fayetteville. Are you ready for an adventure? Check us out on the web at adventuresonthegorge.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Adventure Forum. I'm Chris Hayes, coming to you live from Adventures on the Gorge. For our viewers on Zoom or Facebook Live, if you have any questions for our guests, please use the Zoom Q&A function or Facebook comments to submit them at any time. Near the end, we'll open the discussion to questions from viewers if time allows. Tonight's forum, which we are calling the Dawn of Rafting, is part two of our series on the history of whitewater travel on the New Ngali River. Part one was a lively discussion about the earliest history of river running on the New River Gorge. We started with first Americans use of the river, went through John Marshall's 1812 Bateau expedition, and ended with speculation on the first recreational runs in the 1950s. You can still watch it on our website, adventuresonthegorge.com, where you can find the Adventure Forum link near the top of the page. This evening, I am joined by three legends of the whitewater industry. They are the founders of the three rafting companies in West Virginia. We have Tom Dragon of Wildwater Expeditions, Emra Silaji of Appalachian Wild Waters, and Paul Brewer of Mountain River Tours. Thank you guys very much for joining us this evening. Thanks for having us. And we're gonna hop right into uh, some of the questions that we've got for you guys. Um, Tom, we're gonna start with you. Your, uh, your brother, John, was basically the father of West Virginia rafting. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about him? Sure. Uh, other than the fact that he was my big brother and I hero worship him throughout my whole life. Uh, a lot of people knew him in a different manner, in a different light. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. Uh, he had vision. He had ideas. He was a mentor. And he was a river guy. And, you know, I think that sums it up. And a lot of people want to know, you know, how he got to West Virginia and, and all that other stuff. Are you interested in any of that or how, how, how much detail yeah. do you want me to go into? Yeah, absolutely. Keep, yeah, keep going. That's some of the follow-up questions I've got for you is okay. how we ended up in West Virginia. John, John was a teacher up in Pennsylvania and he worked with uh, Lance Martin and Carl, Carl Kruger on the Yakagani in Pennsylvania. Okay, and that's when Whitewater got into his blood. He was a uh, sea one -er. And uh, he was a river guide with those guys. And, you know, like every other kid, and he was only like 24 years old, you know, so he was just a kid, as we all were at that point in time. He, it was adventuresome. So he went to other rivers, the Cheat, the New, and all this other stuff. Well, I know this is hard to believe, but even back in the late 60s, everybody thought the yacht was getting too crowded, okay? And they were looking for other places to go and, and other rivers to run. And that's why he decided to come to West Virginia because nobody else was there yet. And it was a weekend in August that we just loaded up in the back of a pickup truck. And it was, you know, John and Chris and myself and John's soon to be wife and Richard Mersh and some other friends. And we came down around New River. And, you know, from there, it just blossomed. So. Why, uh, um... So that's the, is that, that's the main reason why they sought out a new location down here. What, uh, there, what there was wasn't the, enough room for everybody up on the yacht. Gotcha. And, and at that time, were people at, from the yacht like coming down here and running the new river? Just nobody had thought to come down here and, and set up shop yet? No, 
No, I, I think I think way back then, uh, the Yawk was the river to run. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think there weren't a whole lot of people who knew about the about the new river back then. Uh, it was relatively unexplored. There weren't any books written. I'm sure there were a lot of people who ran it, but by comparison, you know what you see today, nobody ran it. Gotcha. You know, I mean, you couldn't talk to anybody and get information. And you know, the few people who did run it were so far spread so far apart. You know, you 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 didn't know who they were. So, you know, it was just it started off like I said on a weekend in August and. John had tenacity, okay? When he came down here, I really believe that he knew he was gonna come back and start a company. Yeah. Huh. And what, what year did, did uh, the company open up? Well, John first ran the new in 64, as in a C1, okay? okay. And that, he knew about it when we came down that summer. And when we came down, we were both in college. Okay, so that's why we couldn't come down until August. We came down in August and we ran in August and September. Okay, those two months. But it was like professors that we knew in college and kids that we knew in college and stuff like that. And 68 and 69 were really just weekends. You know, you pack up in the back of a pickup truck and drive down here on a Friday, run the river Saturday, Sunday, and drive back, you know, Sunday night and back to class on Monday. Now, 69, we probably actually ran a lot more in July and August, okay? And then in 70, John actually incorporated the company, okay? And really, that's when we, you know, hooked up with the pews and leased their base camp and, and, and really started in earnest. And that was, uh, that was our first full summer, okay, on the river, because I had graduated from college. Uh, mm -hmm. John was finishing up. And uh, that's when we moved down here. And did you uh, start work at the company like right when it opened up yourself as well or yes. during the summertime? Yeah. yeah, as did my brother Chris in the summer and John's wife. Uh, you know, it was a foursome, you know, from, from day one. And not to, not to everybody help. I mean, John's wife's parents, my parents, other members of the family. It was a family affair from day one. But then, you know, that's how we were raised. Uh, as kids, we all worked for my dad, okay, who worked, who worked with his brothers in a construction company. So we've always been family oriented and working together as a family, which has its pluses and its minuses. Yeah. But, but, it, but more pluses. More pluses. But more pluses. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on to my, my next question, and uh, I believe this sounds like there might be some controversy on this one. Okay. Uh, um, this this is for uh, Emma and Paul. Uh, <laughs> who 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 was the second rafting outfitter on the New River? Of course, uh, Mountain River Tours. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and we, we ran the uh, lower, lower gully continuously or, or regularly, you might say, uh, since, since our day one as well. Uh, you know, we, we uh, actually I ran the river, as you, you know, with Bob Morgan uh, from Cincinnati, Ohio. I was uh, Bob Morgan's first employee when they ran the Little Miami. And um, then we ran the river in a inner tube raft called the turkey raft in 1969 the fall of 1969 and um, actually before that I started a canoe trip with Bob Morgan all the way from uh, Radford Virginia to Thurman where I met uh, the pews and I had 35 cents in my pocket and they gave me a great big sandwich for the 35 cents man it was I fell in love with the area <laughs> So, so Emra, what do you, what do you think? Is, is that yeah, right? What's, what, what's your thoughts, Emra? Well, I don't know when you got started. I know that my first trip was uh, in 1972. Uh, in 1972, we, uh, we owned the, our own rafts, uh, had a company name. Uh, we ran the, the Yakagani 
decided that was too damn crowded. Uh, and the new and the golly in the fall. Yep. And so you opened in 72. And Paul, when did you say you, you opened Mountain River Tours? We actually, in, in 1970, early 70, I ran some trips with uh, Rick Grywe out of Cincinnati. And Tom was on one of those trips. Was that 1970, Tom? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was early spring of 70. Was it spring? I, I was trying to. I thought it was summer. Might have been. Okay. I thought it was summer. I thought it was like Juneish. That, that, yeah, that sounds. I remember we got washed off. There was a heavy rain. Yeah. And uh, I had to drive the bus with all the people back to Hawk's Nest. And then when I came back to Thurman, Bob Morgan was standing up in uh, full voice. And John Dragon was, John, your brother was standing on a trailer in full voice, discussing how to run the river. And um, I just sort of stood back and uh, watched the show. It was quite a show. <laughs> well, so, so you're saying raft guys have always been opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Or they wouldn't be raft guides. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad we resolved this thing. This, this controversy has gone on for at least 45 <laughs> years. Uh, I think the most important thing is not who was here first, but how far we've come over the years. And, yeah. and no, how, much work, how much work it really took. You know, after you contacted me and said, hey, would you do this? I started thinking about, you know, no, there's no way you can put into words how hard it was or how much fun it was 50 years ago. And I think that's what I would get across the night. Okay. There were like hundreds of people who made Whitewater what it is today in West Virginia. So that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, I, I definitely a second that. I mean, there's, it, it was a huge group team effort and, and it was a, a learning curve all the way every day. And, and it was great outdoor entertainment um, that brought a lot of people here. And, you know, we all trained guides and we, we drove buses and, and we did what it, whatever it took to make the guest feel at home and have fun and to safe fun. You know, much credit to, to everybody in the industry for, for working so hard and training and, and doing, doing the best they could for safety. Yeah, we all started as competitors and then uh, uh, became partners and then became friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, that and that only took 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Tom, I got to ask you, um, and, and you can plead the fifth or whatever, you know, when Tay's Landing came along, you know, Emra mentioned uh, we became partners. And uh, what was that like? Uh, you know, Tay's Landing scenario. Uh, obviously, it was a blow to our income stream. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but you persevere, and you yeah. you you know you pick yourself up and keep on going. Uh, I think Tay's really helped open the river up to what it is today, because mm -hmm. obviously we were trying to keep a lid on it because having come from the yacht where Emmer kind of agrees, you know, even back then everybody thought it was crowded, you know, trying to hold the numbers down. Uh, it only took me 50 years to realize that every single person who goes down that river has a good time, whether they're by themselves, okay, or they're in a group of 150 people. Yeah. I, I, I still live on the river in Thurman and I see what goes on every Saturday and Sunday. I hear all those people going past my house, having a good time. Yeah. Now, you, uh, uh, Paul, since you brought up Tays, this can you can you explain uh, what that what that means? And sure. Explain about what the what uh, how it affected uh, Tom, how it affected you. You said it your, it hit your income stream, but what what did, what is Tays and? Yeah. The. We were taking out at Hawks Nest State Park um, and paying for the tram ride up to the top. Um, 
And that was a flat water paddle of about two miles or a boat tow. But, um, you know, somehow that got turned off. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't use it anymore. And we, we had to find alternative access. And I sort of call it the error of trying to find um, uh, or the war of access, <laughs> if you will. Um, you know, we, you're, you really didn't have control of your company unless you had a control of, of access to the river. And Tay's Landing uh, was about a mile and a half below Fayette Station, just at the top of Hawks Nest Lake after the last rapid. Perfect to add another mile and a half to the raft trip. Um, and, and we all, uh, four companies actually got together. EMRA, this company, Appalachian Wild Waters, North American River Runners, and Class 6 River Runners. We, we got together and decided to dig a 90-foot dig a, <laughs> a long tunnel, 16 feet in diameter, underneath the main line of the Chessie system. How crazy was that, EMRA? <laughs> uh, I remember a couple of years after the tunnel was in, uh, we were taking out and one of our customers comes up to me and says, hey, uh, I work for a chassis system. How the hell did you guys ever do that? <laughs> <laughs> but now the, we're making a chassis system is the railroad line that runs runs yeah. over the tunnel. Just yeah, it's the main line. It's, it's the main line from uh, the the Ohio Plateau and, uh, and uh, the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. So it, uh, it's a big, big deal. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Chessie, that's a big deal, the Chessie system. That's down for how many days for you guys to build that? Well, they have a rail line on each side of the river, so they really weren't shut down uh, although they gave us 72 hours uh, to, to, to dig that tunnel, um, put it back with 100% compaction so that they could run right over it. Um, it, was, it was a feat because we couldn't drill right in the middle of the tracks to find out what really was there. What was underneath it. And it turns out there was a huge boulder there. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, Emra? We blew rocks all the way across the river and then so. <laughs> right, yeah, and all the way up to Fayette Station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Emra, you mentioned earlier about it, the, the same as Tom did, about it being too crowded up on the yacht. Is that why you uh, decided to open the Appalachian Wild Waters here on the new? Is that well, the main reason or were there other reasons? We really opened, our headquarters has always been on the cheat. Okay. Uh, and the reason why we, I, I was a kayaker, so that to be a kayaker on the cheat and on the new, I mean, the new is just big water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, cool. Now, let me ask you guys, a, 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 we talk about the, the, the cheat, or I'm sorry, the yacht being, being too crowded. Um, and then think about how the industry here how the whitewater industry here has has grown and contracted a bit in those early days when you guys first opened up what was like numbers wise numbers of guests what was a big number for you guys on the new on the new yeah uh 18 to 25 people 18 to 25 people yeah i mean <laughs> yeah, we had two rafts of our own that came from uh rubber fab rubber fab is a manufacturer in west virginia the rubber uh -huh. fabricators and uh, we had two rafts from there and a, uh, and a Navy assault raft. And uh, basically, most of the time, we just ran the two uh, Green Rivers, okay? John had one, I had one. It was called One Paw and Two Paw. And that was only because of when we were putting the names on the side, John had a St. Bernard who stepped on a paint lead, okay, and stepped on a raft, okay? <laughs> so then after that, we just named One Paw and Two Paw. And, and, uh, and then we borrowed a raft from a guy named Jack Gannon, and uh, eight, yeah, 18 to 25 people, all the way through probably 72. Yeah, uh, in 72, you sold me five of those Green Rivers. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, they had wild water unlimited on them. <laughs> and they were so well 
put on that thing that we couldn't get it off. We tried to scrape, but that was before we heard of toluene. <laughs> we tried to scrape off and it just didn't work. So instead of trying to erase wild water unlimited, we just uh, tried to scuff off the un. So we, we were running trips as well with rafts that said wild water limited. <laughs> I still have my first boat, Tupac. And the oh. paint is still and the paint is still on the side of it. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and now it is. I, I got it rolled up in the church. Right. Every now and then, I every now and then I drag it out. Do you, do you drag it out and take it down the river. Uh, I just just drag it out when people want to want to see want to see it or take pictures with it. You know, old staff, whatever. Gotcha. No, I don't take it on the river anymore. They're three hundred pounds each. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the light version. Right, yes. Yeah. That was before they painted them, and it was 315 after they put one. <laughs> I've still got an inner tube somewhere of the first turkey raft. I've got to locate it. Yeah, I think it's hanging up in Morgan Park. So, you, did, you didn't use it when you reenacted that last year, did you? No, I actually went, wound up going to Ronsiford at a... Uh, logging uh tire uh supplier <laughs> and got a couple of inner tubes for 70 bucks a piece uh, uh, and, Paul. And, and you called yourself a rafting company in 1970 right <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> well you mentioned uh, you mentioned the name earlier uh bob morgan um yes and you talked just a little bit about him but uh, how did he influence you to open mountain river tours like he had he had bought uh, two green rivers I, I think from the same company that that Tom and John had and uh, he was going to go into the business um, but then his canoe livery on the little Miami in Ohio just exploded with business and with uh, that and five sons he decided to stay there in Ohio and sold me those rafts for fifteen hundred dollars and uh, borrowed the money from my parents, and um, away I went, you know. Um, the, my, my mom, I graduated from Ohio State in, in May of 1972 and incorporated actually in 1973, but every time I'd call, call and my mom would answer, there'd be silence on the phone, and uh, she said, what in the heck are you doing in West Virginia, whitewater rafting, we could be, you know, doing the thing with the degree but uh, I was having too much fun it was a great time, <laughs> great time. that's our story and we're sticking to it right yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> although there, there were times when it wasn't so much fun you know oh yeah I remember going up to the cheat uh, right after the flood Emra and uh, looking at that that was that was tough Oh, that was that was yeah. That, the flood itself was bad, and what we did to ourselves to try to recover from the flood was worse. <laughs> That's what you. It's what oh. you do to yourself that gets you more than what the world does for it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Paul. So you guys, when you opened up, you started running trips on the gully pretty much right away. Um, what, what was the extra preparation and in, in, in for doing that? And were you, were you apprehensive about taking that next step? Um, yes, uh, actually in 1971, uh, Mike Marine, who had uh, boated a lot of these rivers and he made his own Augsburg kayak, uh, had kayaked uh, the Gully River quite a bit as well as the New River. And he said, well, if the New River goes above five feet, that's way too high, so uh, we need to have an alternative. <laughs> and, and that's when we found the Woods Ferry access, which was mile you know, 13 on the, on the Gully River. Um, and it was only eight miles from Heiko, West Virginia. So we decided to locate there and, and um, use Saturday Road to get to or Sunday Road and get to get to Woods Ferry and have an access so we could continue running. You know that one of the things in business you have to have consistency, 
And especially if somebody books several months in advance and, you know, makes plans, you, you need to be consistent. So we, we practice on that river quite a bit. We paddle it several times in little Voyager rafts, which are about 12 feet long and practice quite a bit, train quite a bit and uh, start running it, running it uh, really regularly. Every time the new river got above five feet. <laughs> that's yeah that's that's a great great lead in for my next question for tom um yeah you know, it's early on you guys the, the the cutoff was basically four feet about yeah. for the new river and now today all the companies have currently agreed you know the, the as, as 12 feet is the cutoff what what was that how why did that change equipment the equipment uh, but the rafts i mean you know when we ran a green river raft like the first two that we had, okay, mm -hmm. the floors weren't even sealed to the cross tubes, okay? So when you get down through Keeney's Creek or, you know, Double Z or any place like that, you fill the boat up, you could actually swim from the front of the boat to the back of the boat under the cross tubes. You know, you're talking 10 minutes to bail a boat with five gallon buckets, you know? Yeah. Uh, the ne the next after, better, the, the, what's the, that? The five gallon buckets didn't come till later. We started, we all started with milk jars. Yeah, Clor Clorox, one, jugs. One gallon milk jar. yeah Clorox jugs. Clorox jugs work great. Yeah, had a better <laughs> than that, if, a, if a five gallon bucket took. Oh, that, like that was a, a Clorox that jug. We, we found out that they shipped uh, uh, peanut butter to us from Columbus. <laughs> and and we, yeah. we had, had a problem of what to do with these buckets. And so we scraped the peanut butter out and used them. I, I believe that was the first use of five gallon buckets, or at least for us. So we solved two problems. We solved the problem of, of bailing rafts and five gallon rafts are just an incredible advancement. It's almost as big, big as having self baler floors. <laughs> from um, cut on milk jugs to five gallon. Emerald, wow. I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100. percent You know, when you got to spend 10 minutes below each rapid bailing out a bucket, everybody's you know just working their butts off trying to get that done. You know, and then you get into another rapid. You know, you start getting up in the bigger waters, five, six, seven, eight. You got a lot of big breaking waves, and you know you just yep. you couldn't keep up with our second set of rafts. We had uh, the floors sealed to the tubes. That made a big difference. Then you bump it up a little bit. Then we went to big boats, 24 inch tubes. That helped a lot, uh, but self bailing boats solved a ton of problems. Yeah, sure did. Absolutely. What was it? What was it like to try to drive one of those non self baler boats when it's full of water? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, you, 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 had to, you had to plan carefully. Yeah, if Care you didn't drive it; it drove you. I mean, yes. if you didn't plan a hundred yards in advance on where to get to that eddy so you could bail that boat. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a pretty picture. Yep. It, it was like a D8 dozer with, you know, half the brakes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, um, you know, even though we used the oars, you know, we had a rear mount system that was developed from the Western center mount uh, scenario. And, and uh, Bob, Bob really perfected it. You know, he used the o Ohio pond to perfect that system. That was a good test, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that it, it seemed to us to, you know, you, you, could, you could move that raft, but, you know, how much does water weigh when you have how many gallons? Several. 8.72 pounds? pounds per gallon. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Times a thousand gallons. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, those green rivers. Once that floor dropped down, and there's yeah. a bit of a thousand gallons in there. Yeah, at least. Yeah. 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 yeah self bailers. You know, every every little improvement in 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 materials and workmanship made a huge difference. You know, as Ember said, you know, those rafts weighed three hundred pounds. You know, when they started using lighter materials and stronger materials and the glue held up better and the self failures, everything made a difference in bringing the industry to what it is today. And Size, I, shape, 
everything. Yeah. yeah. I, I think slick also that, you know, the guides also learned, I mean, we all, all learned a little bit each year, you know, what the levels were going to be uh, or where to run at each level. And, and, you know, I think the knowledge base also increased quite a bit as, as we went along. Um, I agree with that. You know, that's, that's the, both that combination, that teamwork together, you know, just kept, kept the industry stepping up. Uh, and I think everybody will agree that guides made each and every company what they are today. Absolutely. Yeah. No matter what you did or I did or John did or Amber did or anybody else. Okay. Yeah. The guides who came to work every day and entertained those people. Okay. And got them down the river safely. Yeah. Okay. And came back and cleaned it all up and put it away and got up the next day and put a smile on her face and did the same thing. Okay. Yeah. They're the ones that have taken us to the level we are today. I think. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, totally. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm gonna take a quick uh, program break here, make a little announcement, then we'll get back to it. Um, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Adventure Forum. I'm Chris Hayes, your forum host. Uh, every other week we are hosting discussions on topics of interest for local and traveling adventurers. I am live here at Adventures on the Gorge on the very rim of the New River Gorge, America's newest national park and preserve. If you happen to have any questions for our guests, please use the Zooms, uh, Zooms Q and A function or Facebook comments to submit them. And uh, we'll try to get to all those questions uh, near the end of our, our uh, show today. Um, let's see. You, know, you guys have been doing a great talking about what the, what the early whitewater rafts were like. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough, even in 92 uh, or 93, when I first came down here to do the gully, there was already self-bailing boats. And I think like two years before when my dad and some of my uncles and aunts and mom came and did the new river, they were still self-bailer boats. Cause that was part of my dad's story was he was the, he was the bucket guy in the boat <laughs> in their boat. Um, so how, when it comes to the history of the New River Gorge we've, we've, itself, the, the industries here, how important was that to you guys, like educating guests? Uh, you know, was that a big part of your, of your companies, Tom, to start with you? Uh, I think it was. Uh, and John pretty much, that was his bailiwick. Uh, he was very, very interested in the, in the history. Uh, and it played well into, uh, into the raft trip because you know, back then, as Paul said, access and egress meant everything. Well, way back when, it was Thurman, Bay mm -hmm. Station, and Ortez. You know, there wasn't any canard or, or anything like that. You know, there was flat water in the morning. You had to paddle through it. And you got entered. And that's why I said, you know, the guides entertain. You got to keep the guests interested. So, you know, we started talking about the old coal towns and Coke ovens and, you know, Melsini fields and, and the different people that, you know, that, that made the gorge, what it is, and actually found it long before anybody, you know, thought about running the river, like you said in your last, uh, you know, segment about, you know, the history of New River, the, you know, the, the Henry Fords and the, and the John Nuttlebergs and the Captain Thurman. And actually, John had everybody who came to work for us, uh, you know, once you made the cut, you knew you were getting, uh, you were going to be employed for the summer, you actually had to write a five page single space typewritten paper on some facet of the history of New River, wow. okay? They were, they were not in the whitewater industry as master species. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and those were all compiled and shared amongst the guides, okay? So that they would learn the history because, you know, people were interested in, in why, why we were there and what went on and the railroad. And, and there's a lot of history in the gorge, too much for any one person to, to know. So. Yeah. That absolutely, uh, Paul, Paul, and Emery, you guys feel the same way about that when you started your companies. Yeah, we, we yeah, we definitely we we hiked. You know, if the water was too high, and guide training, we would hike through the gorge and and uh, look at the towns and the unique areas. Uh, we would hike up Nuttall before Nuttall was you know Nuttallburg, and before it was finished. Um, a lot of that. A lot of that was part of the training. Also, you had to tell jokes. 
you know, you, you had, you know, you had to stand up and tell jokes in your raft. That was, that was a huge important part too. But I can't say that on the air right now, what the jokes were. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to assume we can't tell any of the jokes on a family friendly show like this. <laughs> well, we have family friendly raft trips too, but yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and things, I think, think things were real different back then. You know, in the seventies, you could still see things in the gorge. I mean, it hadn't been that long since since places like Nuttleburg or Brooklyn, uh, you know, had shut down. There was a lot left at Barry. You could see, you know, the old the facade of the company store was still there. You know, the uh, the blasting shed at Kmore was still there. The Kmore Company Store Foundation was still there. So. When you went down the river, people would say, hey, what's that over there? What's that over there? I mean, it was, it was there, you could see it. You know, last, last 50 years, a lot of that has just crumbled and fallen apart. Yeah. And uh, you, said, you said that, that Barry, you could see the company store there as well? Uh, yes, uh, actually there was, the face of the company store was there. Uh, you know, the center section was kind of falling in. And it had the, uh, the two ends, you know, that came up to a point and a little bit of a roof there. And there was actually a lady who lived there. Uh, her name was Melcini Fields. And she lived in the ruins of the Barry, of the Barry Company store. Uh, I don't remember what year she died. I would probably say it was in the late 70s, early 80s. Yep. And... The family who, <clears throat> who had, a, had a store in Thurman, the Pews, okay, looked after Melcini. And like in the early days when Melcini could, you know, she walked from Barry to Thurman, went to Pews grocery store, uh, picked up her food, tied it in a bandana and a stick over her shoulder and walked back down to Barry. You know, the guys from the railroad would throw coal off, you know, so she could keep warm. But I mean, the lady lived you know, in the ruins of the company store for years and years and years. And that's where she passed away. I'd, I'd heard in the past uh, that uh, on rafting trips, guides, guides would uh, you'd pull over and run up and leave food on, uh, by the railroad track for her as well. Is that, is that a true? I don't, I probably. Probably. I mean, you know, people looked after her. I know we had a guide one time that worked for DHHS and, uh, he was well aware of, excuse me, Malsini's situation. And he actually got, you know, grant money and went down there and built a metal shed, okay, for her to live in. Okay, we went down there and put it up and insulated it, put it in a cook stove. Never, ever did she stay in that. Okay, she used that to store her coal and firewood. Huh. Wow. So, a, a true outdoorsman. So. Sounds like it. Outdoors person, I should say. She Outdoors was person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be a question for all of you guys. Now uh, we'll just go one at a time. At, at what point after you guys started your companies did you guys realize like, hey, this is this this could be big. This could be be successful. How how long did it take before you starting to get that feeling? I mean, we went from. You know, you guys, Tom, you said a big day in uh, the early days would be 25 people on the water. And, you know, but in 90, 1995, when the company reached its peak, or not the company, but the industry reached its peak of 250,000 rafters within the whole state of West Virginia, but the majority of that here on the New River. When did that, when did you get the feel, when did you get the feel that like, this is, this is going to go, this is going to be big? Oh, the first weekend that we uh, filled all of the rafts I bought from John. <laughs> oh, was that the first the first weekend you filled all your rafts up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I had five rafts, so you know, that was forty five people. At at that time, how did you guys? How did you get the word out to the rest of the world that hey, this is going on here? Well, well that, those were those were hard times because. The general population thought of a raft as a bunch, you know, the Mark Twain kind of idea of a raft 
because you take a bunch of logs and tie them together and go down. And I, I think that we, we all learned to become videographers before videography became an art. And, you know, just to try it with the photos. Uh, the photo, the Julie photo, I think it's right over there. Uh, you know, there you go. <laughs> Uh, it's pr pretty hard to, to think to, uh, of that as a bunch of logs being tied together and and it was a great great photo and that would, uh, we used that as a line conversion of all of our t-shirts that was the logo our logo and uh, you know it, it we, we sort of had to to move away from hey this this is uh, sitting on, on, a, on some flat water floating on, on the New River or floating on, on the Ohio River to, hey, this is fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember going to a lot of travel shows, you know, from, from Chicago to Cleveland to Columbus and Cincinnati and, and then down into Charlotte. Don't, don't, don't forget Harrisburg. In Harris, <laughs> oh, that was huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we became ambassadors uh, for West Virginia tourism. Literally, we would we would be three and four deep outfitters at these shows trying to convince people to go whitewater rafting. And, and uh, you know, that it was it was tough com competition. But in the end, it was getting the word out that West Virginia was was the whitewater of the east you know, on the New River and the Gully River. And, um, you know, with the Gully River having a fall season, and that's a whole nother story. I mean, we could go on for hours about that, you know, and, and um, you know, Whitewater Wednesday and, and how all that sort of gained uh, political support for the area. But uh, going to travel shows and convincing people that this is a great time. This is a lot of fun. You should try it. Um, I think went a long way. I, I agree. I think travel shows, uh, you know, and, and there was probably a point in time when, you know, you say four or five, I can think of the Cincinnati travel show, which was a biggie. Uh, you might have seven or eight outfitters there, you know, pushing the word. And, you know, there wasn't a social media. It was print. You know, everybody, everybody had a brochure. And then I also think we have to give credit to the state of West Virginia. And, People like Arch Moore and Dudley, Lysander Dudley, who back then was the commissioner of the Department of Commerce, who really got <coughs> behind outdoor tourism. Okay, and they did they did travel writers tours, where they would bring travel writers from Chicago and Pittsburgh and New York and, and all, England and all over, and they would showcase everything there is to do in West Virginia. They'd put them on a bus and wine them and dine them and take them around and go on the river and go to state parks and and then they would go back and write stories okay and if, if they put out a story and it it made the the front page of the, of the chicago tribune you knew you were gonna get more people coming down the river yeah, um, yeah, when you, yeah. We, we were lucky that the, the state really got behind the outdoor industry well and i don't want to single out lysander okay but you know he headed up a department of people like John Deese and Bill Burton. And I can't even begin to name all the people who were supportive of the industry. Yeah. It's pretty easy to be supportive of the industry because, because it functions as an export industry. Um, well over 95% of our of the new and Bali customers were from out of state. So the, when, when you study the economic impact, the multiplier, you know, for an in, in, in state business is 1.2, 1.3, whereas for, for an export business, it's uh, more like three or three and a half. Plus the fact that we pretty much consider ourselves, our job was to get the customers to come in, come to West Virginia and we grab them by the ankle and shake them to all their, all their coins let loose. Well, I heard that was going on over at AW, and Rob, I, I, you know, now I know it's for fact. <laughs> hey, we didn't. I, I think we began to realize that that you could really that, that, that you could make a living at, at 
you know, in this industry, once we got the season extended, yeah. you know, when we learned to run the higher water levels in, in May and, and you know, we'd push our training sessions to April and then you could run the golly season all the way through the back then it was through the end of October because it didn't start till squirrel season. You froze your butt <laughs> off over there. But I mean, once you found out, you know, you could, you could stretch it to seven and a half months instead of, you know, two and a half months. Okay. Then I think I realized, you know, yeah, I can prove my parents wrong and make a living at doing this. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I think one of the big successes of all the outfitters was sitting down uh, with the Corps of Engineers and, and you know, the, the governor and, and the tourism was behind us. And, and I remember going with, uh, I believe it was Mr. Fowler from the West Virginia Tourism to, to Huntington to talk with the Corps of Engineers to release water from the gully or into the gully from Summersville Lake. And there was over 3,200 and some people booked to raft on the gully that weekend. And, um, you know, that was, it was controversial. They would not give us a guarantee for water at all. And that started the scenario um, uh, of teamwork to convince them through study and in and, and cooperation of, you know, we can make this, as, as one of the engineers said 15 years later, it's a win-win-win. We can have enough water for Charleston, we can have enough water in Somersville Lake, and we can have enough water in the river for whitewater rafting. And, and it was proven out, Richard Punnett, Dr. Richard Punnett was the main uh, guy at Corps of Engineers in Huntington. Uh, but we all had to work hard together, even though we were tough competitors. Uh, we worked at that. Remember many trips to, to Huntington and, and uh, it, it, was, it became an example really of, of cooperation through the Whitewater Commission now. And it's an example that many others uh, look at. All right. Well, um... I'm gonna move on and, and uh, go ahead. We've got a few questions from some of our viewers here and I'm gonna ask these, uh, they're not in any particular order. Um, this first one, I'm a little nervous about asking, uh, it says uh, from Jer uh, Jared Campbell, um, how, how different are today's raft guides from the 1970s raft guides? <laughs> um, I, I think they're pretty similar really. I mean, you know, they. Everybody's very colorful characters, uh, you know, great, great uh, dedication to the, to the whitewater rafting. I, yeah. It takes a certain mentality to come live this lifestyle for a little bit, doesn't it? Yes, it really does. And they're great people uh, until the day that you have to manage them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can attest. Come on, Amra. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty, pretty difficult to manage, but boy, they're great folks. Yeah. A, a river guide who is not a river good river guide doesn't last. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think the guides today are every bit as good as the guides you know that we had in 1970. Uh, well, we've also picked up a lot of techniques and a lot of equipment that make the life of a raft guide much easier. But it's also lost some of the romance. You know, yeah. back back in. In the early 70s, this was something new. Uh, whereas by now, you know, there are 200,000 people, presumably and hopefully, running New River every year. I, I, I agree with you to a point, okay? But what we always tried to instill in our guides was remember what it was like for you the first time you went down the river and you saw a whale rock, okay? And that person who's on the river today that's their first time. And it means just as much to them on that day as it did to you back then. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, it's all about attitude and, and, and you know, parting that attitude to the guests and, and you know, that, that real infectious, uh, I guess that's not quite the right word, but, you know, you, you need to have, particularly in this light, but anyway, you, you know, you, you want to enthuse the people and, uh, you know, the guys were certainly there and, 
And so it was a team effort. I mean, there was drivers and people on the phones. I mean, it was just, a, it was a family. We all became a family, you know, because everybody depended on each other, um, you know, to, to, to have a great time to make it work. And, and you had to depend on the guy in front of you and the guy behind you yeah. as far as the rafts go, because, you know, everybody sooner yeah. or later makes a mistake and somebody else is going to save your butt and then you're going to save somebody else's butt. Yeah. And, and you do, it, it was, it was a perfect family team effort. Yeah. You know, you Absolutely. were always watching out for each other. And I think they still do that today. Yeah. I, I think you too. Uh, I'll have the, someone's got a question for you here. Uh -huh. uh, this is from a Chuck Miner. Um, says, what years did uh, Mountain River Tours operate out of Dexter's and when did it move out to the Sunday Road location? Um, we started in Dexter's. That was our first real base, uh, 1973. And uh, we moved out about 1976 or seven, that, that era onto Sunday Road. Um, yeah, it was, it was a little car repair shop owned by the rules that we rented right on the side of the road. That, that was the Sunday Road location? That was the uh, Route 60 location um, that the rules owned, or Dexter's it became, after we left, it became a uh, Dexter's place. Yeah. Gotcha. Or some of them called it the Ting, because they painted all the sign off of the front of the Dexter's and left the last part of Raft Ting. T-I-N-G. <laughs> the, the Ting. They called it the Ting. All right, um, and I'm going to go, this is another one for, for each of you guys to, to, uh, to answer. I think this is a great question. This is from a Kelton George. If you had to pick one thing to tell a person about to go into a raft guide training, one piece of advice, what would, what would it be? And let's, Tom, let's start with you. That's a tough one. Because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things you want to tell them in there. No, I, I, I'm not so sure you can tell somebody why they should be a raft guide. I, I, think, I think they have to find it, and this sounds corny, but they have to find it in that inner soul. You know, when somebody comes down there, okay, and they fall in, fall in love with the river, so many, of, so many of our raft guides became raft guides because they came on a raft trip. You know, and when you go down the river and you see the most spectacular section of the gorge for me is between Kinney's Creek and Double Z. And when you come around the corner and see Whale Rock, you know, and you run that, it just, it does something to you. And you just know right then and there, that's what you want to do. Um, and it, you know, a raft guide's good for four or five years uh, as, as a norm. You know? Say what? And, and that's, what's that? Say what? <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying for a lot of the guides, you know, who come down, they, they, it gets in their blood, but everybody can't make a living at it. Okay. And they're not as fortunate as Paul or Emma or myself or my brothers. So they have to move on. Okay. And find a career that's actually going to give them more money, but they never get the river out of their system. They come back forever. Yeah. That's a, that's how a lot of the guides that I get into training classes, that's, Hey, I came rafting one, you know, last year, and I want to be a guide. That's how I got into it. Yeah. You know, it's a real personal thing. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely a real personal thing, and and it, you know, it has a lot to do with with the surroundings, but it has a lot to do with the trainer themselves. I mean, we used to rotate the trainees amongst three different people because sometimes you wouldn't relate to one trainer, but you would to another. And, and you would pick up little pieces and each of us would, would, you know, compare notes and hopefully the light bulb would start to come on. And, and again, it had a lot to do with the attitude. If that person, you know, had a lot of enthusiasm and, and persistence and, and a great personality, then yeah, we stuck with them, you know? Um, and I, I think it's all about the attitude and, and the personality of the, of the guy, you know? And Emrit, what uh, piece of advice would you give to someone just getting into thinking about getting into raft guiding? Enjoy. Remember to enjoy each day. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Even, even when it's 30 degrees and it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> what a great day, huh? Yeah, any day on the it, river is a good day. Yep, yep. It, it's a lifetime of memories, too. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I've got another a couple more questions I'd really like to get to. Um, the uh, first one is from somebody who I also understand is a legend in the whitewater industry. It's from Bob, from Bob Lynn, oh. and it's a this is a question for you, Tom. Though he, he wants to know what uh, what year did when your brother first went to look for New River? It would have been sixty eight. Sixty eight. Yeah. And and I, I understand Bob Lynn. Like I said, he's he's a legend as well. He was uh, on your turkey raft expedition, Paul. Yes, definitely. He uh, recorded it, um, and it's on the uh, YouTube. Um, uh, it was a turkey runs through it. Um, Jay Young has also got another part of that as well. Um, well documented. Um, kind of scary when I look back at it, you know. But uh, thanks much to Bob Lynn and, and uh, you know, his recording. Of course, when we got out to scout it, somebody said, oh, I'll take pictures. And it was like, well, we haven't scouted it yet. What do you, why, why do you want to take pictures, you know? And this was at Whale Rock, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad he did. Glad he did. And he's a lifelong friend. And he lives in Charleston. And, uh, you know, he he's still has uh, some great memories. And, and it wasn't an easy task to take, to take pictures back then either. <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, everyone, no. you know, today, you know, you put you strap a GoPro on your helmet and you got the whole day's events. I mean, wrapping a camera up in a waterproof bag and protecting it and taking a picture and yeah. you know saving your film and getting it developed i mean it was a it was a long process long and that's why a lot of this has not been recorded unfortunately yeah, yeah. all right i wish um, we i wish we had cell phones back then <laughs> 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 Um, I've got a question here from a Brad Beck. Um, Paul, I'm going to uh, ask you this question. Uh, could you reflect a little bit on, on how the rafting industry has evolved over the decades, how you know expanded to offer overnights and camping and lodging companies have added on more recreational offerings like rock climbing and fishing? Um, how I, just about how that's happened over the years. I mean, rafting used to be, you came on the weekend and you went rafting and then you went home and now you can stay a whole week. Yeah, that's, that's the maturity of the, the rafting industry and sort of, um, you know, just to share the beauty of the area. Um, you know, an overnight trip is fantastic. I wish we could go three or four nights. Um, you know, the Western trips uh, were multi-day trips. You know, the Grand Canyon's a famous, what, 15 day, 20 day trip or seven day motorized. But, you know, um, there's just, there's just many opportunities. There's hiking in the area, uh, beautiful hikes. Um, so that the outfitters decided to branch out like any business, you know, you want to branch out and try different things, new things, um, you know, lodging, lodging became really large uh, for the outfitter to get into in this area. Um, so it's just a natural progression, uh, maturity of the industry. Cool. Um, let's see, I've got a uh, Kathy who's coming uh, from Facebook. Um, she's asking, can you uh, speak to the outstanding equipment truck and bus drivers who got everyone to and from the outposts? Uh -huh. And how the conditions they drove in have changed. For example, the shuttle buses out of Bucklick. <laughs> there's a couple of our great bus drivers there yeah there there's no doubt that there was a myriad of people who made the operation work on a day-to-day -day basis uh from the people who packed the lunches to the you know equipment drivers to the bus drivers i mean it it takes it takes a lot of people to make it look seamless yeah, we, we had a, uh, one of the ladies that 
that cooked for us and made our lunches. We call it, we call mom. And, you know, Pat Leg uh, just was, she was mom. You know, these guys are away from home and uh, they needed somebody to talk to. And uh, she took them under their wing. And I, I'm sure every company had, you know, a mom or a dad that, that would sit there and talk with them and, and uh, reason with them and just say, hey, everything's great. Let's go have some fun, you know. Uh, what were the what were the, the, that person mentioned uh, the, the traveling shuttle bus out of Buckley? I mean, I know that's that's still a pretty uh, tenuous drive back in there. What was it like coming out in a bus? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> that coming out of Buckley, the, the first the first quarter of it, you sort of the twenty two person buses, and then. Uh, Move them into bigger buses at uh, one of the one of the roads, side roads that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an adventure. Some people thought the bus ride was more exciting than the river, right? Yeah. <laughs> they they still do. <laughs> they still do sometimes. Yeah, and that's all and the whole adventure. Adam, I got a, I got a quick one here for you, Paul. What uh, this is from Chuck Miner again. What year did uh, Mountain River Tours catch fire? Oh my gosh, Chuck! It was 1991. 91. Uh, yeah, as best I can recall. Uh, yeah, and it was because a fluorescent, a four bulb fluorescent uh, transformer got too hot. Huh. Yeah. All right, and I've got one. This is going to be uh, the last question for the evening, and I'm going to ask each of you guys this. This is actually not coming from me. This is coming from Dave Arnold. Um, oh. He's watching on Facebook, and he wants to know, uh, for each of you, uh, what was your most memorable day on the river? And let's start with you, Emra. Gosh, that's going to take a lot of sorting. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I'd rather not talk about the scariest days. So, you know, I think that one of the things you learn as a raft guide, one of the things that customers always want to know is what is your favorite river? And there's a correct answer to that. The one I'm on. The one on. I like it. Oh, great. Oh, oh what's your most memorable day? Well, this one flashed in my mind really quick. Um, Again, we were working with the Corps of Engineers and the water was coming up uh, on the gully. And they said, well, well, we'll give you a four hour window, but you gotta go now. And we had like three trips booked. It was about 14 rafts. Um, so we went early, all 14 rafts together. And we, we did a rolling safety all the way down the upper gully. Not a problem in the book. I mean, it, I don't know that we had a swimmer. And we got to Woods Ferry and guides were just, yeah, high five. And this is the greatest day. And, and we looked around at the guests and they were like, is that all there is? <laughs> <We're> like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you did not build that one that's up. A, that's, it's like when, when uh, a guest tells you that their favorite part of the day was jump rock. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, really? <laughs> And uh, Tom, what was your what's your most memorable day? Actually, I have two. Uh, you got two? I, yeah, the, the first day, the first time I ran the river and saw Whale Rock, and I, I that is imprinted in my mind. Okay, and then the day I met my wife. You met her on the river. You met her on the river. Awesome. Yeah, that was uh, forty three years ago. Wow. So. Congratulations. Right. Yep. Thanks. I. I those are the two most vivid days of my mind. Awesome. That's a, that's the, that's a great answer, Tom. Yeah. It's true. Very diplomatic. <laughs> she made me what I am today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I met Mile on uh, St. Patty's Day. Mary O'Mahony was there, and I can't say anything more. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up here. Um, sorry if we didn't get to everybody's answers or get to everybody's questions this, uh, that were coming through this evening. 
But uh, please join us for our next adventure forum on Wednesday, March 17th at 7.30, um, which will be the history of whitewater rafting part three. Um, thank you once again to uh, Paul, Emra, and, and uh, Tom for joining us this evening. We really appreciate you guys being here. And to all of our viewers out, viewers out there, thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next time. This is Chris Hayes signing off from Adventures on the Gorge.